Um, hello everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Akash. Uh, I work with the flip the web performance team at Flipkart. Um, so today we'll talk about how we use perceived performance to make Flipkart faster. Um, but yeah, before that, how many of you feel Flipkart.com loads faster? One, two, three. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, this is my team. These are the guys you should blame if Flipkart.com loads slower. And that's me on top. We have Abilash and Arya. And uh, yeah, uh, all, one of us, okay, all of us work on separate departments. I work on the desktop. Abhilash works on mobile and Arya on server side. Uh, you should also have a performance team at your organization if you haven't. So yeah, that's our team, and you should also have a performance team in your organization if you have not done till now. It helps build a performance culture at the company. Um, yeah, that's it. I really hate slow websites. I hate it when people just test on the connection they are working with, their office connections, and then get away with it. I mean, that's miserable. And we in India are seeing people getting onboarded to internet or with all sorts of connections you have with these data cards. We have our ISPs which throttle the connection when, once we cross the FUP. And we have horrible internet connections in India. And it really bothers me when people do not test their websites across all different types of connections. They just leave things as is. And it's a responsibility that we fix. Sure. Um, yeah, cool, thanks. So, yeah, I mean, you should make sure that your website works on all, or not, but uh, not all, but at least the least connection uh, available in, with us. So, and you will realize this only when you face it yourself. You will realize this only when the websites you build, you only feel that they're slow. I mean, you come across a slow connection and you feel the website is slow. I mean, I really hate these white pages, I see the title of the website up there, but there's nothing rendered. And I, all I see is a white page. I feel the web is slow because of these white pages. It feels slow because of these white pages. And the white page is the, actually the fastest thing the browser could render. I mean, it doesn't need anything to render this. Anything you add on top of it, browsers will have to download to compute Java, your JavaScript and render it on the screen. Now, today we'll just see the download part. We'll not talk about JavaScript performance. We'll not talk about rendering performance, jank bursting, or anything else. We'll just see how you could download the content to the user in the best possible way. Um, so let's see this. So you start from this. Uh, you put your CSS on top. You put your JS at bottom. You use a CDN. You basically use all the rules on Vyslow they have listed. And users still say that the website is slow. What do you do then? I mean, you have followed all the rules, you have done almost everything, but still users say that the website is slow. Um, that's when perceived performance would help. It's not their internet connection, it's because the way you have written your code, it's because of that, it's make, it, it's because of that it makes them feel it's slower. I mean, this to me is perceived performance. And you don't always need the fastest bike to win the race. You need to have a good strategy to load the content to the users. And it's all about how users perceive your page load, whether it's in a flash, I mean, not a loop flash, in a flash, or it takes ages to load. That's, that's how they will feel. They'll not say it loads in two seconds, three seconds, or whatever. You have to make users believe that it's load, actually loading faster, even when it is not. Um, now let's see how we do this, how we can embrace progressive enhancement techniques to make sure our pages load faster on all sorts of connections. We'll see things which we had done. Um, yeah, this is the home page 
uh, this is actually the below the fold of the home page. So we push out home page very soon because it's where all our visit starts actually. So we push out the above the fold of the home page very soon and the below the fold looks somewhat like this if you quickly scroll down. All you see is skeleton screens waiting for the content to be loaded. You buy more time from the user while the content loads. And when the content is ready, it goes in and sits in this. And people also know that, okay, this is where my best sellers would come, this is where my mobiles would come. If I'm not interested in those, I can move ahead and I, I can keep scrolling actually without the actual, the full thing being loaded. Um, yeah, this is that very recent Moto G page we developed. Um, so how many of you bought Moto G from Flipkart recently? <laughs> it was really madness that day. <laughs> so yeah, this is that page. Uh, the left one is how it renders on a slow connection and the right one is how it renders on a fast connection. Now, how we do this? I mean, it's actually really simple. The left one, if you see, uh, the images have not loaded, but what all we have done is we have put a background image, background color of blue, so that the text is visible. People can read the text while the images are loading. I mean, our designers wanted all sorts of like funky, uh, your full full screen images, full width images, your uh, uh, like this parallax scroll on this page. And we were like, this all will not load on <laughs> slow connections. What will people see? So we, then we s took a step back and we said, okay, let's give them at least something if, if while all this loads. So this is how we do it. All the buttons, everything is clickable on slow connection while the images load. The images are not blocking the content here. They're just enhancement. Um, so other techniques that people use are like show them exactly how much time it is going to take look, how much of it is already loaded, like Gmail, optimistic actions. Uh, when you like a photo on Instagram, it immediately sets that as like, even when the network call is happening, because it believes that 99% of the time the call will succeed. Uh, this makes the user experience really better for the user. And this talk will see the third point, uh, paint what they're seeing right now. We'll see how we can get users to see what they're seeing right now very quickly. Um, next is measuring perceived performance because it's really hard. I mean, how do you know that the, the the user is perceiving your website slow or fast? And it's very difficult to fix something which you cannot measure. And let's see the techniques for it. I mean, first thing you find on the internet is synthetic monitoring with tools like uh, with pitch test. Uh, I hope people have used it here. How many of you have used web pitches at least once? Okay, so I'll go over these. So yeah, WebPage shows you load times, it shows you waterfalls of requests, how your requests happen, it shows you CPU utilization while your page is rendering, it shows you network utilization, it even shows you film strips that how your uh, page is loading at what point. Uh, one really interesting feature of WebPage test is the film strips. This is uh, the screenshot of our page on WebPage test. Um, it has this frames on top and network network waterfall on the bottom. As you move your mouse through the frames, you could see what request is happening. So you could accurately drill down that, okay, this is the request which is making my web page slower. And this is how, if this request is slow, this is how the user will perceive it. Um, yeah, this is one of the codes from one of our emails. Why is it taking 751 MS to download a 5 KB image? This is just after a developer ran a web test on one of our pages and he says to me this. And that's the problem with web tests and tools like this in India. That they give inconsistent load times on every run. Every time we'll run it, we'll always see a new load time. Or we'll see some random request taking too long. And we don't know how is it happening. I mean, I mean, it's, it's probably because of network conditions over there, but we don't know how often it is happening for our users. The bigger question is, that how often are our users seeing the page the way WebPage test is seeing them? Are they also seeing it that way? How many percentage of users see the page this way? And how we could go about uh, fixing things there? Uh, so here comes real user monitoring. Actually, real user monitoring, or RUM as we call it, it requires a lot of, uh, it requires a lot of infrastructure because you need to get the data from browsers, export it, run your, uh, Run your, run your Hadoop jobs over it or whatever processing over it to, to get the metrics. 
there are third party websites that do it log normal sosta and so on and you should be using one of those actually and window unload so this is the basic real user monitoring you could do it's really web 1.0 it doesn't tell you how your page loaded the above the rule might have completed very early actually and this is the bare minimum you should track if you're not tracking anything you should be actually just tracking this and browsers fire window unload when all the requests started before onload end so any request that starts before window unload it will count towards your window onload this includes your images your ajax requests or whatever are started before onload so they told that okay let let's give some so let's give some detailed info about how the page loaded so w3c gave us the navigation timing api uh, it tells us that okay this is how much time it took for the dns this is how much time it took for the tcp this is how much time it took for the server to pro server and how much time it took for finally the client to process it and for big sites like us the server time is very less it's like 200 milliseconds or something just that and it, we won't get much optimizing it this is where most of the time is going like it's in seconds it's not in milliseconds it's in seconds the time spent there and we would more we would want more details about this processing part i mean we just cannot leave like this we want that okay if this is taking 3 seconds on client side what exactly is taking 3 seconds and what if you could export request from you real users and reconstruct the picture that okay this is how the request loaded for the guy and this is where resource timing api would help you resource timing api gets gives you all the requests that happened in the browser the load time the start times and you could even get the dns and the tcp times if cross origin headers are set and this is really under documented actually this is very recent and chrome and latest chrome and i even i10 supports it actually so navigation timing api plus the resource timing api they give the complete end to end picture of performance that how the page is loading for the guy it gives you a complete picture of how the network was that for that guy and you could choose to see that where exactly time is being spent and so this is what we did so we exported data from browsers and we ran hadoop jobs over it to process data and see that what exactly is happening with the users why are they saying it's slow um, and this is what we saw this was exactly the scene at the browser when the page was about was loading it was complete chaos i mean we have so many requests starting they are all competing with for bandwidth they are all interfering with each other and they are uh, they are they are blocking each other so actually we are consuming the number of amount the number of http connections we could make in browser and everything to sort it out uh, we visualize this in a form of a waterfall like we see in webpest test or your chrome dev tools this is from real users actually and it has the start time and duration of all the requests and the moment we saw this we found out that there are a lot of optimizations possible but how do we pick that one which would give us the maximum amount of benefit so we set down to identify critical requests and in this case the critical requests for us were the css the logo um your sprite which has our cart icons and all major majority of the icons and this banner on home page which occupies almost 50% of the area we said that okay if we are able to download this for the user it he would feel that it's it's so almost loaded and he would start interacting with the page and this was the time that above the fold load was happening and we should aim for getting this as low as possible now some of the findings some more findings from the resource timing apis uh, css and javascript are heavily cached over requ requests and the median for css and javascript was under 100 milliseconds actually and cleaning up javascript css would hardly move metrics it would hardly make things better for the user but css load times are critical css is blocking resource and we need to make sure that we keep a tap on what size it is and because it affects the start time of other request we need to make sure, still make sure that it's as uh, small as possible javascript you should load it in bottom just do not clean up javascript just because 
your performance is slow. And yeah, what was slow? So Google Analytics, Omniture calls, they were all taking like 500 milliseconds for us for on every page. I mean, we could hardly help anything about it. But yeah, after this, we know that, okay, where is the time going? And redirects. We were doing a lot of redirects. Again, we'll see how we fixed this later. And HTML document itself was taking long to load. And images, images as they are known, they are really slow. They're still slow for, for the web. So to clear up things, we divided our uh, requests into types of requests and when to load these type of requests. We had this critical request. We said that let the browser handle this. Browser network managers these days are really complex and really smart. Let them ha do the heavy lifting and make them make the critical request discoverable to browser as soon as possible. Do not put something which in JavaScript which your browsers which your browser's parser will not be able to snatch and preload it. <coughs> Excuse me. Now the non-critical below the fold request. Uh, you should lazy load images, you should lazy load the modules which the user is not seeing at that moment and you should probably do this at DOM ready. And third party code, so third party code is again evil for us. I mean, you don't know what these guys will do. Whether they will inject an iframe into your website or another JavaScript or another JavaScript or another image. You don't know, you don't trust them. So make sure that these do not consume the resources which could be used to download resources which your users would see. You should uh, make requests for this after onload. You don't have control over these. All in all, the data from resource timing API is a gold mine actually. Every time you would look at it, you would always discover something new or the other. Um, let's see that, how we went about fixing things which we identified with it. Um, fixing images. Um, so this is the talk we have, we were having almost every day. A developer would say that this image is huge, give me a smaller one to the designer. Um, designer will say, okay, how small you need. Developer at that moment would be really confused and he would make a random guess that, okay, give me this size image. But we should not make guesses. We should use data. We should use the data from the resource timing API. An example that was at the banner on home page, it was 730 cross 300 px. It took 50 KB for, if it, it was a 50, if it were a 50 KB file, it would take 380 MS to load. This was from real users and actually hap happening for our users. This is the data we use to win all these battles with the design team. Uh, fixing carousals. So again, I mean, carousals are again really terrible. This is a carousal on our site. This is on home page, landing page, and all other pages. And if wrongly, it's very easy to wrongly implement it. And this could affect the overall page performance very adversely if it is wrongly implemented. We'll see how we implemented it, what was the wrong way, and then we'll see the right way. So the wrong way is that all the images on all the slides loading in parallel. And we have, the situation we had was we had 350 KB images which were loading in parallel and each one of them would take 830 milliseconds to load because they all compete for bandwidth, they all compete for network connections available at any moment. This is, and actually we were just showing one image, we were not showing the other three. Why, we will why were we loading the other ones? So that's what we did. So we were just loading the first image the other slides of the carousal were loaded after after the after the, after the page loads uh, or when the connection was idle and we loaded these images via markup directly like image src equal to as a critical resource so that browser can snatch this and load it as soon as possible um yeah this is a, another technique we use on mobile website um, yeah we have this browse page and product page people navigate very frequently between the two they click a product on browse page and they go to product page and this is what we did. So we used the same cached image from browse page on product page and we upscaled it as a placeholder image so that people at least see something on the screen while the big image is loading. This is how we made it feel that okay, it's actually loading faster but it's not. Um, yeah, theming, I mean all developers hate themes I believe. 
Um, so this is how Flipkart looked on Diwali. And you could see that the header is brown. We have all these small decorative items on the left and right. And it just then went on from there. Then they, we had this on Christmas, this on the Valentine's Day. And while we were doing this, we said to ourselves that the Christmas tree or the Diwali doodles, they should load after the main content loads. They should not interfere with the main content. Your banners, your product images should load before these start. And this is how we came up with progressive festival theming. Uh, all through, while, while we did all these uh, themes, the designer and developer were sitting next to each other and they did these themes actually. And yeah, theme is non-critical resource. It should complete after all critical requests complete. All functionality should work with the base skin. And theme is just an enhancement. Limited to colors and background images. But you could see that, okay, we achieved a lot even with this limitations. Another was, was that we will not use any other new DOM elements for the theme. We'll just use before, after, pseudo elements to make things work. And all this would be packed in a single theme.css file, which would be then loaded asynchronously after DOM ready. Yep. Next is about fixing HTML size. I mean, HTML size is very important because it affects the discovery of critical requests for us. Um, for us, the HTML size was big because of this menu. We had this huge menu on all pages of the website, and this actually evolved heavily over the time. As we were adding categories, every category would go in these menus, and we would not know. They were all controlled by like business people, and like, so like in few days, this menu was huge. I mean, they, they abused this. I mean, all almost all the links are there. Initially, there was just a menu and a sub menu. Then there were even tabs within the sub menus and multiply it across the six main categories. And this is how actually the menu is actually, let me just play this here. This is how the menu would load on a slow connection on a data card like connection. You would see that there is a small pause as it loads. And this was happening for all pages. Menu was there on all pages actually. And this was the markup that looked like we had our header on top, the search bar would appear, but then this menu would come and it would look tuck, tuck, tuck. And we had this big menu HTML. And then we had our critical images up there. And this is how we identified that, okay, if we could cache this part of menu and browser itself, we would be good. So that's what we did. Over 40% of our menu was, uh, or 40% of our markup was actually menu. And it was persisted on client side in local storage for 10 minutes because it doesn't change. It changes very f less frequently. And it drastically reduced the payload we were sending for every request. Overall, it gave us around 200 milliseconds of improvement. And this was both for mobile website as well as your desktop website. This improved a lot. We could see in actually with the resource timing APIs that the start time of the request uh, dropped after we did this. Um, yeah, coming to redirects, redirects are really costly. I mean, it's really easy to get them wrong. Uh, so I visit a website. I go to I, I go to the website on phone. I type in website.com, then the website re decides to redirect me to the website slash m, and then it decides that no, it has to be an HTTP connection actually. It then again redirects me to https website.com slash m. This is bad, I mean, this this is really bad for mobile. It will kill your mobile site if you do not, if you, if you redirect randomly. Um, so it all starts with a shortcut actually. P developers write this condition, if some condition, redirect. And then all other developers would do is they would just put their R conditions with this some condition and take that shortcut. It's really bad practice in the code. We saved almost 700 milliseconds on the search pages. We found that at one point, all of our search pages were redirects basically. They would, e some even had two redirects actually. Um, yeah, next is 
So you should decide your real strategy between mobile and desktop very early on. Because if you don't get it right initially, you will be left redirecting people from here to there. You should prefer a single URL between mobile and desktop. Um, Flipkart.com for mobile for desktop, good. Flipkart.com slash am is bad. I mean, because you you would have to maintain two sets of URL every time a new page request have to come to you. You'll have to decide that what will be the mobile URL for this, what will be the desktop URL for this, and how do we redirect from here to there. It makes things easier in the long run if you choose this early on. Um, and mobile set some mobile some site performance highlights. Most of the things we discussed were actually applied to both desktop site and the mobile site. And we'll see some mobile specific things now. Uh, much of the connections, much of the users actually come from 2G connections in India. It's like 50% for us. Uh, we were using click initially, but when then we moved to touch start and that gave us a 300 millisecond advantage. I mean, touch start fires almost immediately, but click would fire after like 300 milliseconds. That's bad. And we A-B tested heavily to find out what's the right mix of content for the screen size, for the screen size and the bandwidth. You should also do this for your content that, okay, what is the right mix? What, how many results per page people want to see? You will not get it just by designing yourself actually. You need to push out, you need to experiment and see that what your, how much results people are expecting for this. Um, uh, next to sustain, a performance is a moving target. You cannot say that today you would do performance and get away with it and you don't you won't have to do this later on you cannot do once and forget to sustain you should have a performance team in your organization like we have it's very important actually and these are, the performance team actually evangelizes evangelizes to all other developers about what could go wrong if you do not do this and you should always measure key performance metrics like your first byte, your uh, above the fold load, DOM ready, window on load. You should be measuring this and keeping an eye on this very regularly. And when each of these is breached, you should get an alert. Uh, you should use web page test to in your continuous integration to make sure that whenever someone check in, checks in a new file or a new request, you know it. And you know what impact it could have on your load times and how will it interfere with other requests. This is about it. Now a little about the future. I mean the future of performance is prefetching actually. And prefetching will give near instant loads to your web pages like your apps. Native apps are cheating with prefetching actually. When you open a Flipkart mobile app, let's see what happens. The Flipkart mobile app is 8.5 MB for iOS. Tell a web developer that you could download 8.5 MB of data, how happy he would be. With this 8.5 MB of data, the app could show splash screens, it could show initial placeholder content, it could show stale data, it could do a lot of things. And the moment you open a web view, uh, hit across a web view inside an app, all you see is this, a white page. I mean. And the web view doesn't have any other info. All it could have at the most is that the DNS could be prefetched. That's it. It's zero bytes actually. I mean, and this is where prefetching would help. Um, yeah. So some food for thought for prefetching. Prefetch auto suggest. Auto suggest is something browsers heavily prefetch. The moment you type your address bar and type something in Chrome address bar it goes in there and it prefetches the web page first result and you could even prefetch your next pages if you know that okay the user the users are actually most likely to visit the next page uh, of the results um, service workers again it's very interesting api uh, it's very interesting w3 proposal it's expected to replace uh, your web app cache and the way it would be is that the mvc itself would be on the it will be offline. The, the JavaScript MVC that we write today will itself be on the browser cached. So the browser would know that how do I handle this URL? Do I have all the resources to de to deliver it or not? Or if I do not have the resources, I could cache some resources and make sure that I show something to the user. And yeah, this was very recent again. Uh, if you have been following Hacker News. 
prefetching on hover and touch start because this could again this starts request fairly early on and people see near instant p just because of this this is something we should all experiment with and that's it i mean i'm done with my talk uh i we have time for questions now questions Like so, in one of the first few slides, you mentioned that Omniture and Google Analytics were beyond your control. Yes. Uh, what will happen if you load them after document load, after uh, the content is loaded? Oh, uh, we would lose some tracking calls. So, we would our number of uh, visits will be less, or number of pages that will record will be less. That's why we okay. have to is, make them early on. Is there any service that right now you're seeing that uses the performance API to give you an entire picture and uh, timeline? So, you guys wrote your own. Yeah, we wrote our own, and we, because we didn't find anything like that. And I mean, this resource timing API is very new, but I could see that a lot of these sites, log normal or Keynote, they would come up, they would enable this very soon. They should be enabling this very soon. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, hello. Yeah. 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 Oops. Yeah. Uh, so you told about asynchronously loading CSS, JavaScript, and all after the main critical thing loads, right? Yes. So won't this affect the render cycles of the browser? Like you are injecting different HTML after the load. So yes, each it, time it reflows yes. the page, it re-renders the page. Yes, it affects. It sort of affects. But again, that you'll have to see that what is the benefit I'm getting out of it. You have two things that it could affect rendering performance, but it could. But if you're doing this, you could. You, you could flush out your above the full, full above the full content very fast. So this is a trade-off we have to take. And what we do is that these elements that we load after uh, page load, we mo we make sure we put them out of the flow by translate z hacks and sort of. So you were telling about the main menu, right? If look yes. Right. So you told it's some kind of a template or something, right? It's loaded after the HTML loads. No, it's then not loaded after. The server doesn't send the menu. The server sends the menu if. Uh, the client doesn't have it. Once a client has a menu, it sets a cookie that uh, I have the menu. Don't send me back. Okay, so set in the server side. Yeah. Because menu is on the top of the screen, it doesn't make sense to like load it from the bottom. Yep. Anything else? Hi. Uh, it's a continuation of the same question. I mean, like uh, this related to the submenus, which is you are storing it in the local co yes. local storage. Yes. You mentioned the time frame is uh, 10 minutes. Yes. I mean, like, is there any specific reason only for a 10 minutes? Um, yeah, because the menu could change. I mean, our category is they keep updating the menus very often, and we would not want 404s in there. And generally, the the, the amount of like you would view. You would view a lot of pages in 10 minutes, then you would come back to the website, and then again you would start your browsing. So it's like that. You st when, once you're starting the browsing, we would load a little slow. We will we would load a little slower, but again after that, for like few minutes, your experience would be better. So you mean I mean like after 10 minutes, the, I mean basically you keep on updating the menus in your website. Yes, it changes very frequently. That's why we have to. We cannot leave it for like half a day or a day. Anything else? So I'm available at this URL for uh, any questions if you have after the talk. Thank you.